we've seen the EU, and now we've looked at the EU institutions. Now let us consider the EU legal order and EU law. There's one key case from 1962, Van Gend en Luce, G-E-N-D space E-N space L-O-O-S. A case of the Court of Justice from 1962. Um, and the court declared that the community itself constitutes a new legal order in international law. It is a new legal order in international law that confirms that states have voluntarily limited their own sovereignty. They have limited their sovereign rights. Community law sits alongside national laws, but like national laws, they impose obligations on member states and on individuals, but they also confer rights. So they impose obligations and they confer rights in the way that laws do. Two years later, two years later, the court ruled again. In the following case, Costa v. E-N-E-L, Costa v. E-N-E-L, that the treaties of the EU have created a separate legal order which is integrated with national orders. So yes, it is a separate legal order, but it is a separate legal order that is integrated with national orders, meaning we need to consider both systems. States have limited their authority, but over key areas of legislative competence. It is not over everything. It is over those aspects of regulation that are identified within the treaties. But also, and this is most important, they've created a body of law to which individuals and member states are subordinate. Are subordinate meaning that EU law is supreme. So if there is a conflict between national law and EU law, EU law wins. Now, similar to the UK system, EU law is denoted both by primary and by secondary legislation. We have both primary and secondary legislation. Primary include the core treaties, Treaty of Rome, Treaty of Maastricht functioning of the European Union and European Union treaties. Secondary law includes the laws that are created by the, institu the EU institutions by powers afforded by Article 288, Article 288 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. This is includes secondary laws and what we have in mind are the regulations. There are regulations within the EU. There are directives within the EU and there are also opinions within the EU. All of those are binding. They're binding in different ways, which we'll come to a little later, but all three of those considered secondary legislation are binding. So we have primary, we have secondary, and in contrast to the UK system, so I said similar to the UK system, we have primary and secondary legislation, but in contrast to the UK system, we also have a third level, tertiary legislation, what I mentioned to you before, the general principles of the EU. And these are developed specifically by the Court of Justice. And those are meant, as I said, to guide national legislatures, are meant to guide national courts. Some examples then, we see from these principles, there are a variety of principles, some examples. Legal certainty is an example. Legitimate expectations is another example of these principles. Proportionality. Equality, due process, equity, a series goes on and on. But these are principles that national legislatures and national courts are meant to abide by. What this means is that if there is a domestic law that breaches the treaty, well, as we will see, right, there is action that the commission can take against the member state. If there is legislation that breaches a directive, again, there is action that a commission can take. But if there is a statute that breaches a general principle of the court of justice, 
but there is also action that the Commission can take. What might be controversial about that third level of legislation? It may have been in existence a long time prior. A second one, it's not in fact legislation. Primary legislation, the treaties, we understand to be legislation. Secondary legislation, we understand, that makes sense again, regulations, directives, all of that's legislation. And in this case, the third one is the general principles of the court. Not exactly legislation, but you're bound by it. All right? What other points of possible tension there? In this case, we refer to the Court of Justice. The Court of Justice is the judicial wing of the EU. And now we have the legislative wing of a member state. Legislative wing of a member state that is enacting a law, and then ultimately that is found to be in conflict and has to be revised, if not repealed entirely, because it is in conflict with a general principle of EU law that has been decided not by, obviously, the national parliament, not by the EU parliament, but by the Court of Justice meaning by judges who have been appointed by the executive. So in terms of that separation of powers, we're now challenging parliamentary supremacy and subordinating parliamentary supremacy to the will of judges who are meant to promote European Union interests. So we can see how that would be a point of tension. EU law, so within the EU uh, legal order, EU law has effect on member states, but it also has effect on individuals and on private entities. So when we say private entities, we think NGOs, we think corporations. Now, first off, member states are required to uphold their obligations. If they fail to uphold their obligations, if they're in breach of a directive, if they're in breach of a provision within the treaty, other members, or even some of the institutions, can bring action against them. And we see this in relation to the treaties, primary law, but also in rela relation to the regulations and to the decisions of the EU institution, which count as secondary law. These are treated as directly applicable, meaning that the member states must act on them. So as soon as the directive is enacted, as soon as the judgment is delivered, member states are required to act. Now that is distinct from the European Court of Human Rights, which we saw last week. So here we're speaking about a different, the European Court of Human Rights is empowered by, which body? The alliance, which alliance? European Court of Human Rights? Is it by the European Council? No. Is it real by the Commission? Not exactly. Nope. Remember last week, the Council of Europe. Council of Europe, which is separate. That is the Council of Europe. Here we are speaking about the EU institutions and the EU legal order. It is critical that you make that distinction, that differentiation. These are directly applicable, meaning the member states must act on it immediately. That is a requirement of the treaties. Directives, as I said, directives are binding as well, but they are only binding with regards to their outcome. Take the Equal Pay Directive. There's an Equal Pay Directive. We're concerned about inequality between genders, between men and women, as far as pay. So there's an Equal Pay Directive. It's not an Equal Pay Regulation. We can look to other aspects of other treaties for that. But there's an equal pay directive. Now, when we say with regards to outcome, it's binding only with regards to outcome, it means, any, uh, it means member states can choose any approach that they wish to achieve equal pay. And we see variegation in this. France, for example, imposes quotas on example, corporate boards impose quotas in terms of the number of women who are going to be on corporate boards and parity of pay for men and women. 
So they take an overt approach of imposing this. That is distinct from the UK's position. The UK uses a shaming approach where they out the corporations that do not pay men and women equally. And in fact, there was a bit of a kerfuffle around this recently because the government said it was not going to pursue this. It was not going to release data on corporations that did not pursue equality on corporations that were in breach of this. So the response from people was saying that that means that you yourself are now in breach of the equality pay directive. Because the shaming is the strategy that you were pursuing. So usually what we see within a directive is going to be something of a timestamp. You need to achieve this within the following years. After that point, then action can be brought against that member state if they have failed to achieve the goal that has been set out. EU law also has direct effect. So I said to you they are directly applicable, meaning states must act on them immediately. But they also have direct effect. And what that means is that individuals can make claims under EU law. So we know we can make claims for breaches of national law. Well, in fact, individuals can also make claims for breaches of EU law. We understand that laws or that legal systems operate both publicly and privately. And direct effect also has two characters to represent that. First, we say that there is vertical direct effect. Vertical direct effect. EU legal rules are enforceable in the public realm. They're enforceable in the public realm. That means that cause of action can be brought against public bodies. Action can be brought against the state, against public actors. When we say vertical, we are effectively positioning the state above the public and saying that the public can make a claim against the state for a breach of EU law which sits at the supranational level. But then EU law also has horizontal direct effect. So vertical direct effect and horizontal direct effect. EU legal rules are enforceable in the private realm as well. That means that they are enforceable between private actors. So I can bring a claim for a breach of EU law against not just a public body, but against a private entity. Which begs another question, what about directives? Can directives have horizontal direct effect? More difficult one, and the answer is no. Directives only have vertical direct effect. They do not have horizontal direct effect. Why not? What is particular about a directive? A directive is a goal. It is outcome oriented. That means that we're concerned with the steps the state is going to take to ensure that that happens by a particular point in time. Empowering individuals now to bring action against other individuals, private entities, could interfere with the macro strategy that has been implemented by the member state or that is being implemented by the member state. So we say that for a directive, it only has vertical direct effect. If the state fails to achieve it, the state fails to achieve it, and action can be brought against the state. Now, as mentioned earlier, and this is what I'll conclude on, the commission has enforcement powers. The commission itself has enforcement powers. And the commission can take direct action against any member state who fails to implement EU law. The Commission does so. The majority of Court of Justice cases that we have, the majority of them, by far, by a landslide, are a result of the Commission bringing claims against member states. And, in fact, 
To their credit, member states usually accept the Court of Justice's rulings. This is in contrast to the European Court of Human Rights, but when it comes to the Court of Justice, they do tend to accept the rulings. Member states can bring action against each other. However, similar to legislative proposals, they must raise the issue with the Commission first.